New South Wales Small Business Month is on in March 2022. And even if you're not in New South Wales, this episode is worth a listen as it's more an example of things available to you as small to medium business owners to take up and therefore you can look out for similar events in your state or your country. By the way, if you want to know what we're offering for New South Wales Small Business Month in March 2022, jump to the very end of today's podcast and we will share that information with you. We have got a lot coming up. You can jump onto our website at faqbusinesstraining.com.au in our upcoming events tab to see what we have coming up. We look at Small Business Month from a couple of perspectives. One is taking advantage of a whole plethora of free and low cost small business and medium business activities. And on the flip side, also not overloading ourselves with so much information that we're not going to do anything with. This is another episode on thought leadership and challenging you to think about what you attend with regards to training and avoid the dreaded procrasti learning. Welcome to the FAQ Business Podcast for business owners covering four pillars, actionable education, inspiring leaders, businesses like you, and thought leadership where we challenge your thinking. Hosted by myself, Jane Tweedy, I'm founder and lead trainer of FAQ Business Training, where we want to avoid you getting ripped off or ripping yourself off. We'll feature an amazing diversity of guests with lots to educate and inspire you. Let's jump into today's episode of the FAQ Business Podcast. I'm Jane Tweedy, the founder and lead trainer of FAQ Business Training. And I run a lot of training, particularly during events like New South Wales Small Business Month, because that's where I'm located. As a business coach, advisor and trainer, there are a lot of reasons for me to continue studying. But it is also because I am naturally a lifelong learner. I love to absorb new things. However, I'd hate studying. As soon as you chuck in that assessment, look, don't like it. However... I am conscious of the fact that sometimes I am signing up for things I really don't need. I'm never going to use. And then I have some sort of buyer's remorse afterwards thinking, why did I bother buying that in the first place? In today's podcast, I'm going to run through the services that are available, where you might find them in your location, including special events like the NSW Small Business Month, the real risk of procrasti learning, cognitive overload, and whether you're going to use it or not, and the learning style that you prefer, but also the way that the session is going to be presented. So let's jump on into today's episode. First of all, the services available. You may be pleasantly surprised if you look into your local council area, your local government, or even federal government, and find out what is on for small to medium businesses in your locality. This, of course, also includes things like local chambers, networking groups, business enterprise centres, all sorts of places that will help you to get your business kicked off. And many of those sessions could be low and no cost because it's in the interest of the government and these local bodies to support you. Because if you do well, what do you do? You hire people, you pay taxes. That's a good thing. Another great place to look is meetup.com. Here you will find all sorts of things, not just business related. You can find dating or friendship sites, outdoor activities, all sorts of things. But there are definitely a lot of business networking groups on there. It was designed around live events, but obviously due to COVID, it has seen a number of events move online and therefore it does accept online events now too. But don't be sad if you can't take part in New South Wales Small Business Month because you're bound to find something available to you in your locality. So just have a look around and you might be surprised what you find. There may be special events like Small Business Month. For instance, I know Victoria has a Small Business Month as does New South Wales. Special events like Small Business Month are a really concentrated way of putting focus onto small business and medium-sized businesses, and therefore they are typically connected to things like government. 
Because I said before, they want you to pay taxes. They want you to hire people. So they want you to do well in your business. In this year's New South Wales Small Business Month, this year they offered funding to any not-for-profit that was going to run a business-related event, which may have included some of the business chambers, but also to local councils. We are fortunate enough to be close to a number of councils and not-for-profits, and therefore we have been asked to speak at a number of these events, which is awesome. So we've got a lot of opportunity to meet with people, talk with people, and get you know, our message out there, which is that we want to help you avoid getting ripped off by teaching you what you didn't know you didn't know. If you want to present at one of these type of events in the future, bear in mind it is a great idea to get in contact with these people, get to know these people, build up that know, like and trust, show your expertise, authority and trust so that they will want you to be engaged in stuff that they're doing. For instance, I actually got offered rooms by one of the councils because they know me and they know what I can offer. So they were more than happy to offer up a room. And those of you that have tried to get venues, you'll know that that's actually a big thing. (laughs) Trying to get a venue sometimes for a workshop or a training can be exceptionally hard. Apart from the funded events, New South Wales Small Business Month also has the option for having collaboration partners such as FAQ Business Training. So we are not funded, our activities that we run independently are not funded by the New South Wales government at all. However, we can still put our events up on their portal, which makes them able to be found, and that can help us to take part in Small Business Month. The downside of Small Business Month, honestly, is that there's just so many events on. And in fact, one of the councils have decided to not even run their bulk of their programs during Small Business Month. Instead of that, they're going to run them in April and May instead. And it's purely because there's just too much clashing. There's too much overlap. But also people are going to hit overload. They're going to be all Zoomed out if they're doing online. They're going to be all peopled out if they're doing too much in person. And for us in New South Wales, we are really only just getting back to that in-person activity. So that is a big deal. And we're finding people are being a bit slow on the uptake at events, events that should have sold out easily, you know, many times over, just aren't. So it is something to bear in mind that events are still, eh, people are a little bit nervous about attending them, let's put it that way. Another issue with all of this learning is a thing called procrasty learning. What is procrasty learning? It is where we are procrastinating using learning to justify the procrastination. Why is that? Because it sounds better when we're procrastinating to be learning something. Oh, no, no, I'm not procrastinating. I'm learning something. But are you learning something you actually need to know? Or are you just doing it to avoid what you're actually needing to be doing? So very much be conscious of procrastinating learning. It really is a thing that affects many people. You'll know you're doing it. You're signing up to courses and doing courses when you know that really you've got 15 other things you should have been doing, not that course. But in your mind, you're justifying it because you're saying, I'm learning something. That's a good thing, right? No, not always. Not if it was actually stopping you and impeding you. So if you are procrastinating learning, you need to stop and look at what you're doing and go, wait a minute here. Why am I doing this activity? Why am I learning something instead of doing the things that I actually need to do that's important? Is it because I have a fear of failure? Do I have a fear of success? What is happening that's stopping you that from taking us forward in our life? The other real issue we're going to face in something like Small Business Month is cognitive overload. There are so many sessions. It is insane how many sessions there are. And I know in 2020, during New South Wales Small Business Month, I ran 18 sessions, three live Facebook Q&As at night. I ran one live event and all the rest of them were online because it was still during COVID time. And it was a lot. It was a lot. (sighs) And the thing is, obviously, then I can get cognitive overload and get my own brain fried 
when I'm trying to do a ridiculous amount of stuff. And I think this year is probably going to be getting close to the same type of number of events. So we need to watch out for that. And just the fact that we're going to be overloaded full stop. But also, I personally like to present new material for Small Business Month as well. So some of the things I don't have control over. So for instance, the Business Connect activities are same old, same old workshops that I repeat. That's fine. So there's about half a dozen of those. But there's oldies but goodies, you know, business planning essentials, DIY market research, you know, all those sort of ones that people love. They come back for, well, they don't come back for, but, you know, new people will come back for. They're fine. But I'm also teaching new stuff as well. So I like to use Small Business Month as an opportunity to test new programs, but also to deliver something that's really fresh and really new and what is in demand right at the moment. In fact, two of the sessions, I still haven't decided what they're going to be because I'm still just trying to make sure that they're really the most relevant that they can be. I don't want to just deliver the same old. It's boring. And I want to, because I've got the versatility to teach a whole bunch of stuff, I want to make sure it's worthwhile for people. But cognitive overload is about struggling to digest the information. And I know some people in my sessions will get cognitive overload. So they come along for a two-hour workshop, one in particular, DIY low-cost marketing. In that event, we cover 40, 50 different things on the day, and I give a handout that has hundreds of things on it. That session, I go fast, I go hard. So when I'm doing that session, like there's going to be people that are going to go, whoa, 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 too much, too much. That's okay. They can pause. They can watch the replay later. And that's the great thing. You've got to consider how people are going to use the information. Uh, most people, however, comment that they love that session and they love the fact that it is fast paced and that there's a lot of info in it and they can pick and choose which works for them, which is great. And that's the intention. And I'm very clear at the start. I'm very clear multiple times throughout it that people do not need to try everything. And that's why I'm giving them choice. I'm giving them options. So if they don't like this idea, maybe this idea works. That's how it goes. The cognitive overload works in two ways. One is going to be within an individual session. The second way it's going to work is just that cumulative effect of having a lot over time. I would consider, therefore, how that's going to work for you during something like a small business month where you've got so many activities on. So if you sign up for 10, 15, 20 activities, are you going to be mentally capable of processing that much information in your brain? Someone like me? Yeah, I can. But not everyone can do that. And I have the ability to disseminate information and cut through information really well. It's a skill I've had since I was little and I can grab a whole bunch of information. I used to have to do a morning report for a bank and look at financial markets overnight. And I literally had to come up with a one page report in the morning based on all of the information that had happened the day before and overnight. That's a lot. And particularly when there was big events happening, you know, the something happened in Japan and the whole market failed, the global financial crisis happened, whatever. You know, there's a lot going on. So you had to be very quick and very judicious and go, nope, 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 yes, no, 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 yes, <laughs> as to what was important and what was not. So I got really used to doing that. But if you're not used to doing that, you may find it difficult to actually pick up the things that you need to know, the nuggets of information that are important to you. And sometimes, honestly, it can be the tiniest piece of information that can be vital to you. For instance, I presented at an event uh, last week and that event, I mentioned a few different things, obviously, but one of the things I said was that you only need to be better than the people you are teaching. So you only need to be like a few rungs ahead of them. You don't need to be all the way at the top of the ladder. You just need to be a few rungs ahead. In fact, it can work in your favor when you're only a few rungs ahead, because if you're so far up the ladder, you're just completely out of touch with that person that's at the bottom. So therefore, it actually works in your favor. And one particular person, just it really sunk in for her. And she's been having some issues with self-doubt and just believing that she is the person that she is. Like, she's amazing. But she doesn't always believe it. And certainly not. And she does a lot of self-deprecating, which is not good. So she puts herself down a lot. One thing she needs to do is to understand that, that she doesn't need to be the best in her field. She needs to be better than the people she's teaching. And it did occur to her, there was somebody in her field that had done something. She was like, I can do that. I'm as good as them. 
And that's the thing, she is. She's certainly good enough to do it, but she just had that doubt. So out of that whole session, that was the thing that really hit home. And one other thing I made about a comment about a sad face, I said, it's so frustrating that you put all these amazing educational posts up and then the one that gets all the traffic is you doing a sad face and going sad face and, you know, because you'd had a bad day and everyone reacting to that. So what did she do today? She put up a sad face. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, at least she's learning. <laughs> She's following my ideas, which is quite funny. But the thing is, it's great because she wasn't actually putting herself out there as well. She wasn't showing her face. And it is really important that we humanize what we're doing. And so it was a really great example of taking on board the bits she needed to know. So the whole rest of the session, she might not have picked up really anything particularly, but those two points was the two points she needed then. So in that case, is that procrastinating learning? No because she got nuggets out of it that she's going to use. And that can be sometimes we will go to events with a particular presenter or something, because we know even if the topic's not 100% aligned to you know what we need to know, we know that the way that they speak will actually encourage us or inspire us or motivate us to actually do something. And I've been at events like that where literally the speaker's been talking about topic A, and I immediately go off on a tangent completely on topic C, and the, there's one little nugget there that I can apply to talk, topic C and then I'm off on a tangent. And that's just the way that my brain works. But does that mean that the session was bad? No. Does it mean the session was good? Well, maybe no for other people because if they went to learn that thing and they also tuned out, that's not a good thing. But for me, it was a good thing because I've tuned out into something I actually needed more of. So it's almost the anti procrasti learning. You go to it to actually put you back on track. Um, so just be mindful, though, of procrasti learning. It is an excuse. So the key then is obviously as well, are you actually going to use this? So whatever you're learning, are you going to use it? Are you going to put it into action? Because if you don't, really, what is the point? Now, sometimes you will go to something that's more motivational and it's just more to rack you up and inspire you. That's awesome and cool. But sometimes it just doesn't work. If you're not in the right headspace for that, sometimes that's just like, meh, whatever. You've got to be in the right space. But say, for instance, that you're going to start emailing people and there's a course offered on how to set up MailerLite and you've decided you're going to use MailerLite. Well, that's fine. That could be something worth attending. However, there's no point in learning something like deconstructing a bond manually if you're never going to use it. Unfortunately, that was part of my Masters of Applied Finance and I did have to do that. Sometimes we have to make sacrifices to get the end thing that we wanted at the time. But would I ever use that? Hell no. Why would I ever need to do that? I have spreadsheets. I have calculators. I don't need that information. So that was kind of one of those frustrating things that like, yeah, okay, I learned this. I'm just going to rote learn it for the test, but I'm never going to remember it because it's just not relevant. I mean, the concepts of it, yeah, okay, that might make sense, but eh, what's the point? So learning styles, do make sure you consider what your learning styles are before you sign up to courses. So there are four main learning styles, and there's also the way that you, your whole brain thinking comes into play here. So I do HBDI profiles with whole brain thinking, and that will suggest some things like, for instance, whether or not you're more of a visual cue type person. So somebody that is more planning and detailed, typically they do like reading a bit more. Someone that's a bit more creative and a bit more ideas might like a bit more doing, learn by doing and visuals. So you do need to adjust that. But there is actually four key learning styles. So the four are visual, auditory, reading and kinesthetic. Visual is pretty obvious. It's when you're putting graphics up. Uh, even though the speaker being on screen and flailing their arms around, that's still a visual. So for instance, my podcast, although it's a podcast and most people would listen, I also have it available on video and I also have it available on transcribe blog. So that means someone can read it, they can watch it and see me flailing my arms around and see some captions or they can listen. So listening is obviously auditory. And that's, again, very straightforward, listening to the voice of somebody or speaking back to somebody as well. The reading style, very obvious. It's just reading information. 
Reading is not my preferred style and I almost pulled out of a course because the first entire module was purely about reading and then comp comprehending that reading. It was so boring to me. It was two like 20 page white papers. And I'm like, this is just so dull. Trying to keep my attention for that long, I realized now that I just can't do that anymore. Therefore, you've got to be very conscious that if you are training people, not to do one style and one style alone. Try and mix things up so that you're, you know, giving people options. And like I said, in this case, if you're listening on the podcast, you're only getting auditory, but you have the option to see the visuals and stuff through the other channels. Kinesthetic is the one that's a little bit more difficult to understand, I suppose, for people. So kinesthetic is about the act of doing. So it could be watching a demonstration or something like that, but typically it's more about the person actually doing the activity. So much more effective if they're actually doing it themselves. Now with the visual one, that's fine. Visuals are fine and I'm fine with visuals. But just be careful of if you offer visualizations as part of what you do. So I know some people that do hypnotherapy, past life regressions, all that sort of thing. And they'll say, visualize, close your eyes and visualize waves rolling over you and visualize you're at a beach. The thing is, some people can't visualize. And I, apparently, am one of them. So there's a little test you can do and you can Google this test for aphantasia. And if you Google that test, you will find that it is a test about an apple. And it says, close your eyes, visualize an apple. Visualize an apple. Okay, so you visualize the apple and then it gives you a scale of one to five of what the apple looks like. Number one is your typical red apple, your snow white kind of apple, the red apple with the stalk and the green leaf. That's number one. Number two is a slightly more abstract version of that. And then it goes through to number five. Number five is black. Number five has no, no apple in it. That's me. And that is called aphantasia. That is when you physically cannot visualize that apple. And the thing is, you would never think about it. You would never even cross your mind because that's all I know. So if someone says to visualize someone, I just sit there and go, mm. and I think of the apple. I imagine the apple, but I actually can't see the apple. And I didn't realize other people can see the apple and I can only imagine it. Uh, so it wasn't until it was pointed out recently that there was this thing. I was like, oh my gosh, this is really weird. But it does mean if you are offering things like hypnotherapy, you cannot use the word visualize. You have to actually change it. So you want to say instead of the word visualize, change it to something like imagine or pretend. Uh, just be really careful with it because you can actually cause people to divert their attention, which means you won't be as effective in what you're trying to achieve. With the auditory one, I do have some people that I know, for instance, they, they're very much the auditory and they'll say to me in the chat in a workshop and they'll say, hey, is it okay if I don't take notes because you're going to give me the slide pack later? And I'm like, yeah, of course, because their style is to listen. A lot of people though actually do need to take notes. The act of writing notes is typically more effective than the typing of notes, it tends to actually stick in the brain more. There's been studies done about the effect of handwriting, handwriting notes and actually it translating into memory in our brain. So that's just something to bear in mind. So I'm going to share you the link for the VARK test, the V-A-R-K test. And I suggest that you go in and try it out. So you can do it two ways. One where you only answer the single answer per question and the other way is to answer as many as are applicable. So for instance, it will ask you questions like, if somebody needs to give you directions, how would you like to get them? Do you want it drawn on a map? Do you want to be told the instructions? Do you want someone to take you? So obviously we can kind of guess what those ones might be. You've got a visual, you've got an auditory, and you've got a kinesthetic. So we're seeing which one that you do. So obviously just do that little free test. It takes only a few minutes to do, and then that will help you know what learning styles apply to you. That way, when you are considering doing any training or courses and things, you can go, okay, this one is going to be this type of event. It's going to be more listening. Okay, does that work for you? If it doesn't, don't do it. Do something else instead. The other thing is not just about the way that you learn, but also what is being presented. 
Now, a keynote speech, for instance, at a conference is typically a motivation or inspirational speech. It is not about learning as such. So it's very different from going to a learning workshop. And the thing is, that can be contentious sometimes, the word workshop. Some people treat workshop as you must, you know, take your computer and work on WordPress websites while you're there. Whereas other people will take it, no, I'll learn something and i apply it later. The reason, honestly, why I don't do too much live at the event, I do with some sessions. So there's definitely things that I want you to do in groups, particularly, because it works really well when you get feedback from other people. But what I don't tend to do is say, for instance, you were going to come up with your business mission. I don't give you five minutes to come up with your business mission. Because honestly, most of you wouldn't be able to do it. You're going to sit there. Some of you will come up with something, but it won't be something that you'll end up with later. But more importantly, a lot of people are going to sit there and just tune out because they won't even be able to know where to start with their mission. It's something you really have to give a lot of thought to. And it's something that could take a year to develop. So to give you five minutes to do in a session, it's kind of a waste of time in the session. I'd rather explain to you what to do, give you reference material or whatever, another training to go do it, and then you can you know, do it later. And I'd rather explain the overall process to you rather than that particular sitting there doing nothing. So that is each trainer to themselves. And But I do be conscious of the fact that a kinesthetic learner, that still might be a good way for them to learn. So like I said, there's different things I'll do in different sessions. And I always do try to include some sort of interactive activity. Even if I'm doing more of a keynote type speech, I really do want to have that interactivity with the audience. I don't want them just sitting there. It's just not my thing. So the motivational speaker, the inspirational speaker, they're typically just giving you those big high level mm, and really connecting with your heart. That's what they're there to do. So they're not there to train you to fill in gaps. That's not what they're there to do. They're there to give you that motivation for the future. Some people have amazing stories and, you know, you can really just get taken away with them in their story. So storytelling is hugely important and being able to be a good storyteller is something that I highly recommend learning how to do. To wrap up today, I'm going to go through what I'm going to be covering in New South Wales Small Business Month. Even if you are not in New South Wales or this is well after March 2022, don't worry, still listen to this because it might give you a little bit of a feel for the type of variety of things that we do and that we present at in our business. The New South Wales Small Business Month theme is Rebuild, Recharge and Renew. So it's recognising that COVID has decimated the small to medium business market, absolutely decimated it. And that's why we need to go through this rebuilding phase, recharging and renewing. That is what we're doing. To give you a feel for what we do, I'm going to just go through some of the courses that we're running in this small business month and the type of people that we are aligning with as well. Because I think it just helps to cement the type of connections that are good to have in your local community. So New South Wales Small Business Month is great for those in New South Wales. Look out for the events that we're involved in, but also obviously others. So what are we involved in? You can go to faqbusinesstraining.com.au and our upcoming events tab or the button on the front page and you will go straight to the upcoming events page. Check out all the events that we've got happening. Some are still being finalized as I put this podcast together and hopefully they will be up before the podcast actually airs. But if not, you know, keep an eye out because we've got some amazing stuff happening. We're kicking off the month with the IBN, the Independent Business Network in the Hills. And it's a live face-to-face session. And we're going to basically do a session with six half-hour marketing slots. This is a really different event because the request from the members was something to do with online and offline marketing. But it was also to do something quite practical. So I have put together basically six half-hour sessions that work together to give them a bunch of different activities to do. So we're going to do things like we're going to shoot an Instagram reel on the day. We're going to shoot headshots even. So some very different things that we don't normally do in workshops. So I hope that's going to be really good for the attendees. I am presenting about half a dozen workshops for Business Connect during the month. And they are more the staples. They're the go-tos that kind of always come up. So the business planning essentials, the DIY, low-cost market research, etc. So these tend to come up all the time. 
but they are very popular and there's always more people opening businesses or more people that just simply haven't done that start off stuff. So there will be some good seminars there. All those ones are no cost online webinars for New South Wales residents. There will be another live event or Swire FM. That's going to be a community based marketing event. So really focused on the community voice and the local connections, which I really love the concept of this. So I'm really looking forward to doing this event. We'll be running through local marketing initiatives, things that you can do like local newspaper, local radio, local networking groups, everything that you can do locally to really target an audience in your local area. And just the connections with referral partners of local businesses. We'll also be running an event with Breed in Blacktown. And that will be a multifaceted event. So there's going to be sort of four half hour speaking slots as well as some networking. The Dural Chamber is having a lunch and again very much community, local community focus. So we're really looking forward again to speaking at that event too. So there's a few different things coming up. There's also going to be a couple of live workshops that I'm going to run under FAQ Business Training at the Hills Shire Council who have graciously offered me some room space here which is awesome. So I'm going to do a couple of sessions which really do need to be done live or that work really well live. One is a session on product photography or stock photography. So if you want to get those shots for your website, so even if it's something like your coffee, your branded coffee cup or whatever that you want to put on your website, this session is going to cover that. So we're going to cover particular things like shooting jewelry um, or shiny objects because they're always a problem for people. I'm going to teach people how to understand things like composition and lighting and shadows because they are huge when we're doing photography. And the great thing is what I'm going to teach them to shoot, we're going to shoot with our phones. So all you need is a smartphone. You do not need to bring along anything flash, doesn't need SLR camera or anything involved, just your smartphone. And I'm showing you that it's not the smartphone that makes the photo. It's the lighting. It's the shadows. It's the focusing on the subject. It's removing distraction. That's so important. And that's what the session does. So basically I give you a little setup. So I give you an example of a completed photo that I've shot and then I'm making you replicate that photo. I, I've done this before and it's a really popular session. It was great. And like I said, it has to be really done in person. So I'm great, so grateful to be able to offer that in person at the Hills Council. Creating conversations is another one I've run a few times before and they were just so popular. And in a live group, it really is just amazing. So what we do in that group is I go through tasks with you. We do go through exercises in this one. I do get you to do a couple of things before the session because just to make life a little bit easier during the session and then during the session we'll go through some particular things that I want you to add to it. So the things I want you to cover before the session are really just the basics. What do you do? What do you sell? All that kind of stuff or the basic what stuff. During the session we're going to go much more into the how stuff and the things that are much more exciting that will establish emotional connections with your customers. So that is what we're going to cover in that session. We will also be running a couple of live webinars which are yet to be determined and that will be based on what we think is the most relevant, most up-to-date kind of topics that people are struggling with. So we will reach out to a few different audiences and ask them to give their two cents worth as to what they think they need the most of and then we will do some sessions on that. In addition, we will still have our two tea time tips for the month, one for the public and one for our own membership. And those will be on topics, again, to be decided based on what the most current need is. So tea time tips, I literally only decide the topic usually a day or two before I'm doing it, unless there's been a specific request from someone, and then I might be doing that particular topic. Whew. I think that we're going to have cognitive overload after that. But I really look forward to doing it. The sessions that I run myself, those ones have the option to go into the online membership. So particularly the two live webinars will be transferred into the membership. The other ones, we'll see how we go. We might be able to film some of the live session for the product photography and then add in some specially recorded sessions just to make it easier for people doing it from our online school. But we will eventually put some photography stuff up there. Those of you that don't know, I have a diploma in photography from the New York Institute of Photography. I've done wedding and band photography. I do love photography. 
but it's not something I wanted to do as a profession, hence why I decided not to continue with that when I moved to Australia. But anyway, so thank you for listening to today's episode of the FAQ Business Podcast. And I hope that you will take advantage of some of the Small Business Month sessions. The two webinars will actually be open to anybody, so they won't just be for people in New South Wales, but the rest of it is New South Wales domiciled. You will be able to access similar sessions at our online school at faqbusinesstraining.com. And remember, our upcoming events are at our Australian site, faqbusinesstraining.com.au. Remember, even if you aren't in New South Wales, you can check out all the amazing things we have to offer through our online school, but also check out your local government, your federal government, your state government, whatever you've got. Check out your business enterprise centers, your business chambers, your networking groups, and really see what's available in your area. You may be pleasantly surprised. Thank you for listening in. And I hope to have you back again soon on the FAQ Business Podcast. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the FAQ Business Podcast, available on all good podcast services. You can subscribe today via faqbusinesspodcast.com.au or directly on Apple iTunes, iHeartRadio or Spotify. Subscribe, follow, share and where able, review our podcast or leave us a comment on either YouTube or our blog page. Thanks for helping us to help you, the small to medium businesses who are growing and want to make a difference. Look forward to connecting with you again on the next episode of the FAQ Business Podcast. Mm -hmm.